Well, I've always been fascinated by what could be called rags to riches stories. Not so much the lottery stories, you know, where someone buys a ticket and wins a bazillion dollars really for doing nothing. I, I'm not really care about those, those kind of stories, but sort of like Paul Harvey stories. Remember Paul Harvey? You know, stories where people would rise from nothing to fabulous success through hard work, determination, shrewd investing. And one of those people I, I was reading about a few weeks ago is named David Green. Anybody recognize that name, David Green? Okay, let me tell you about him. In the early 1970s, he was struggling to find his vocation. Just couldn't find what he wanted to do with his life. And he noticed uh, some of the decorating trends uh, in our culture in the early 70s. So he decided to take a risk. He took a $600 loan. Not $6,000, not $600,000. A $600 loan. And he started a small picture frame business out of his garage. He called his business Greco Products. My guess is nobody has heard of Greco Products. I hadn't either. Well, his business began to grow slow by slow, little by little, and two years later, he opened his first tiny retail store, just 300 square feet, maybe just a portion of this room here. And then now, today, Greco Products is called Hobby Lobby. And my guess is you've heard of Hobby Lobby. Over 500 stores in 39 states, over 20,000 employees, and Paul Harvey would say, now you know the rest of the story, right? But that's not the rest of the story. Today, David Green has a personal net worth estimated at over $2.5 billion. You should also know that he commits half, a full 50% of Hobby Lobby's pre-tax earnings to give away to support Christian churches and ministries all over the world. He's now invested over $500 million in kingdom purposes during his lifetime. He also closes his stores on Sundays, which some of you may know, even though Sundays is one of the most profitable days of the week in our economy because he wants his employees to be able to spend that time with their family and be able to attend worship of their choice. That's the rest of the story. Today we continue in our series called Kingdom Stories. We're looking at some of the more well-known and some less well-known parables that Jesus told uh, during his ministry that teach us something about the kingdom of God, something about the gospel. And remember, as we began the series, we told you that uh, we are each in the stories he tells. That's the beauty of the power of these stories. So try to find yourself as I go along in this story. And today we're looking at a story about investing or investments. And by way of introduction, Jesus tells this story uh, after he spends a whole chapter in Matthew chapter 24 talking about uh, the end of all things. Because people have been asking him questions. Uh, there were beliefs at the time that there would be a final judgment, uh, which the Bible does talk about. And Jesus has been talking about his own return as the Son of Man, as the Messiah, and what that would be like. And he tells uh, his followers that they're not going to know when or exactly how that's going to happen. They should live in a state of being ready for it to happen at any time. And then, after saying those things in Matthew 24, he tells this parable in Matthew 25. So let me begin, and you can look on the screens as I read. We'll stop a couple times along the way. Matthew 25, verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each, to each according to his ability, then he went away. Remember the context? Jesus has talked about the end of all things, that uh, he will be coming back sometime. So that's the context that people are listening. He must be talking about himself in some way. But that's the beginning of the parable. And the first thing we see in the parable is what I'm calling the master's gift. The master's gift in the story. Anybody here remember the old black and white television show from a long time ago called The Millionaire? Remember that? I remember as a kid watching that. It was in the late 50s um, and it ran from like 55 to 1960. And I remember watching it as a kid. I was fascinated by the show even as a little boy. The show was about a very wealthy man whose name was John Beresford Tipton Jr., whose face you never saw in the show. You only saw his back sitting in a, in a high back chair in a very uh, rich-looking office. But every show would, would lead him to choose one person at random to receive a gift of $1 million tax-free. So every show began with his assistant coming in uh, to his office. You'd see the assistant. He'd be handed an envelope and given a person's name, and his job was to go deliver that envelope. And the rest of the show was showing what happened, positively and negatively, how that gift impacted the recipient's life. Very interesting show. I remember being interested even as a boy. And that's something like the story we look at today. 
For it will be like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Now a talent in those days, and some of you may know this, uh, was a measure of money. Literally, it was a weight in silver or gold. And scholars have estimated, have taken cracks at estimating how much one talent would have been worth in those days. The estimate that I put the most faith in says that uh, one talent, one, uh, that weight of silver would have been worth what an average agricultural laborer could make in 20 years. So in our culture today, you can just say somewhere around a million dollars would be one talent. So if you put it in dollars, you say it's one, he gave five million, to what he gave two million, to what he gave one million. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of a significant amount of money just to put in your servant's hands and then to leave. But a couple of things I want you to notice here. First, notice the extraordinary trust of the master. The master doesn't give specific instructions to these servants, doesn't give them a, a detailed business plan with uh, revenue targets to hit, doesn't even tell them when exactly he's coming back, just puts the money in their hands, and leaves. So in this part of the story, I think we can, we can see just a little bit of the, of the sovereignty and generosity of God that Jesus is sort of assuming as he tells the story. Now, in the parables we've looked at already, in the parable of the prodigal sons, remember there were two sons that were lost, the older and the younger, we see the grace and forgiveness and patience of God the Father who waits for the prodigal to repent and come home and receives him with love and forgiveness. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, we see the mercy and compassion of God, how his love transforms us and we can show that same mercy and compassion to our neighbor. In this parable, I think we see God as the great giver of gifts. God sort of as the crazy boss, as it were. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And so any proper understanding of biblical theology recognizes that if there is a God who created all things, then all things belong to that God. Doesn't that make sense? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. You, me, the chair you're sitting on, the room, everything belongs to him if he created all things. And then, therefore, anything that we have and experience as human beings must be understood to be a gift from that God's hand to us. So all we have, all we experience, all we know is a gift from God's hand. That's biblical theology. But second, I want you to notice something else. And this is easy to overlook. It's not really the point of the story, but I think it's important for us to see because of the culture we live in. Notice that the servants each receive different amounts of money according to their ability. That's how Jesus tells the story. One gets five talents, one gets two, one gets one talent of silver or money. Right now, I hope at least some of you, if you're really trying hard to pay attention, are asking a question in your mind, or there's a phrase going through your mind. And it should be, anybody? That's not fair, right? Hang on, that's not fair. I mean, it's like mom getting out the cookies at the end of dinner. And she goes to her children, you get five cookies, and you get two cookies, and you get one cookie. If we did that at our house, we would have like a brawl on our hands, right? <laughs> Everything in you wants to cry out. That's not fair. That's not fair. It shouldn't be like that. But here's what we need to see, that this parable is not about fairness. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the gospel. And listen to me. This will sound wrong when I say it, but I want you to stay with me through this. The gospel is not fair. The gospel is not fair. Fairness says, I want what I'm due. I want to receive what I deserve. I want what he has. I want life to be fair. That's what our whole culture is about, isn't it? Our whole culture is based on rights and fairness, right? And that's not bad, but that's not what this is about. The gospel says that God gives us what we do not deserve. He gives us what we have not earned. The gospel doesn't work on fairness. It works on something called grace. Right? Here's another uh, mistaken mis uh, assumption that we have often about God, and that is that God is always fair by the way we define fairness. And by the way we define fairness, God is not always fair. 
Bible says it almost from cover to cover. And this is a hard one. God is good. God is just. But fairness is a category, I think, that we as human beings have kind of created to try to make sense of life. And I don't think it's a category that particularly concerns God. Now, don't get me wrong. Fairness is a good thing. But God is far more concerned, according to the Bible, with things like holiness, love, forgiveness, than he is with fairness. If we find ourselves demanding fairness from God, I think we're kind of barking up the wrong spiritual tree. Because that's not what God most wants to give us. And there's nothing fair about this story, as we're going to see. Now, notice, Jesus simply assumes that the servants have different abilities. He doesn't explain, they just have different abilities. So the master gives them different gifts. One of the lies of our culture, and I hear it all the time, you hear it all the time. I find myself saying things that sound like this quite often. And here's how it goes, one form or another. You can be anything you want to be. You can be anything you want to be. Uh, if you do your homework every night, and if you uh, eat right every day, and you, uh, you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. And I'm sorry, but that's not true. You can, because you can't. And I can't. For example... I know some of you are probably mad at me right now, but for, for example, I can't be LeBron James. <laughs> right? I, I did this just to show off my skills, number one, but to, to tell you how ridiculous this would be. I can, no matter how much I want to be six foot eight, no matter how much I want to have a vertical jump of 40 inches, even when I had legs that worked, I couldn't jump that high because I wasn't made that way. I wasn't created with those gifts, right? I can't be LeBron James. I can't fly. No matter how much I want to fly, I can't fly. You could, you could so surgically attach giant wings to my back, I still couldn't fly. Why? Because I wasn't created to fly. Now, I can only be, you can only be what God has created me or you to be. I can be all he created me to be, but I can't be that which he did not create me to be. That's one of the great truths of the Bible. One of the great truths about God's sovereign wisdom is that human beings are created with limitations. We are not God. We have limits. All that started right in the very first book of the Bible within the first three chapters. God created Adam and Eve, put them in the most beautiful place that human beings have ever seen, the Garden of Eden. Everything needed. You can have everything you want. You can eat from everything that's in the garden except that tree. You can't eat from that one, because if you eat from that one, you will surely die. So right at the beginning of human existence, God built limitations into our experience for our own good. We don't do well without limitations. But while the servants receive different gifts, we're going to see that they have the very same opportunity and the very same responsibility. So how are we to understand talents today? And that day, they were a weight of silver, like a big blob of silver what are they to us well i think we could take that in a literal sense we can take them as as money as wealth as resources here at fpcg you hear us talk about this but we believe that generosity is one of the primary ways we can actually express our faith that we can express our love and worship for god we say quite often that almost every time i pray before an offering this is an act of worship Nothing more and nothing less. It's an act of worship. Generosity, we believe, lies at the heart of everything good God wants to do in us and in his kingdom. Generosity lies at the heart of all that. Right now, our leadership here at church is in the process of planning our budgets and our goals for next ministry season that starts September 1st. We have to start this far ahead just to study everything and understand what's going on and plan ahead. So we're meeting with staff. We're having a lot of these meetings. We're looking at all kinds of data. We keep track of everything when it comes down to to money. Uh, and it's important that we do that so we can be accountable for it. But we've seen some really good things in the last couple of years, specifically the last year here at FPCG. We've seen growth, not just in terms of the overall amount of dollars given. We've set records in every category over the last year or two, but we've seen more, more people jumping on board, learning to live lives of generosity. For example, we've seen, we just passed the $1 million mark in funds raised for what we call um, Serve the World. 
So we just started that a little over three years ago. It's giving above and beyond, outside of our budget, so we've just passed the million dollar mark. And many of you have made Serve the World part of your generosity, and we want to thank you because it's making a difference all over the world. From South America to Ukraine to earthquakes, it's making a difference. People are feeling the impact of that. We need to tell you those stories more often. We have over about 100 people gave their very first gift since September to First Baptist Church of Geneva. Almost 100 families gave their very first gift within the last eight months. That's exciting. It means more and more people are beginning a life of generosity, and God will bless that with joy and with lots of things that they haven't even anticipated. So that excites us a great deal. We have more and more people using our online giving option. Uh, we measure that as well. If you're just getting started, a great way to get started is go online. Look how the online giving works because you can set it up automatically like we do a lot of our other, other payments. But this one is the one that will be fun. We did this a few years ago as a family and it helped us tremendously moving toward a life of generosity. So we're very excited about those things because we believe that the gospel, we believe God is generous, number one the giver of all good gifts, and at the heart of the gospel we see generosity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So when our generous hearts line up with his, that's when God begins to do amazing things in a people or in a person's life. So thank you very much for that. But we can also see talents as other things too. We can see them as skills or abilities. For example, we have people that meet here every Wednesday night, some of you may be here, and they work with our Shepherd's Heart Care Center we used to call that just our food pantry, but we're now serving about a thousand, over a thousand people a month through our food pantry. It's right in the lower level of this facility. And on Wednesday nights, a lot of those people come back to have people from our church help them with their family finances, counsel them and how, because many of them have got themselves into problems where they're using a food pantry because they haven't handled money very well. So we have people who, are, who have the ability and the knowledge sitting down with their skills, and they're contributing those skills to other families, helping them get their, to get their feet on the ground financially. That's a talent that's being invested. We could, uh, call, uh, we could point to a group called Master's Hands. A bunch of men, I saw them here this morning getting ready to go out and serve somewhere. They're guys who are good with tools, guys who know how to fix stuff. And they go out and they serve at, at uh, senior adults' homes or, or single moms' homes or widows' homes that need just stuff fixed. Those are skills and talents not everybody has, but they use those in the process of ministry. Or we could see talents as more spiritual giftedness. For example, the Bible talks about a gift called mercy, a spiritual gift called mercy. Yesterday, we had a whole bunch of people out of the West Campus doing a ministry called Buddy Break. It's a ministry to uh, special needs families, and it's an incredible ministry. And people with mercy are really powerful at that ministry because they're patient and they're kind and they have mercy and people can feel that. Or if you have the gift of mercy, you might participate in a ministry called Royal Family Kids Camp that serves foster children in the summertime. Uh, if you have a gift of intercession, it's a fancy word for prayer, you might be part of one of our prayer teams or our online prayer team. If you have a gift of teaching or leadership, you lead or you teach. Or if you have the gift of serving, which I think most Christians have, not all of us, but most of us have a gift called serving, you get involved and serve anywhere where servanthood is needed. That's a talent we invest in the kingdom of God. Maybe the best way to understand talents is to think in terms of the totality of one's life, meaning the combination of time. Time itself is a gift, isn't it? Time, energy, abilities, gifts, and resources. Bundle them all up, and you have a talent that can be invested in God's kingdom. The point is we've all received a certain number of talents from the master, and we all invest those talents in one way or another. That's how the parable starts. Now let's move on to the second part of the story which I'm calling the servant's responsibility. So you have the master's gift, and you have the servant's responsibility. Many years ago, uh, my brother, Joe, who's a pastor in Ohio now, um, he had a friend who introduced him to an investment opportunity. Now, we're pastors. We don't know much about that sort of stuff. And uh, my brother called me one day all excited because this guy had gotten him involved in, uh, in concert promotions, Christian concert promotions. And what would happen is he would write a check and give it to this concert promoter, and in 30 days, between 30 and 40 days, he was receiving a return of between 30 and 50% on that investment. Okay? You get that? So he, he, he invested, and 30 to 40 days later, not a year, not two years, but 30 to 40 days, he's getting 30 to 50% on that investment. Does that sound too good to be true to you? 
It does to me now, too, but not at the time. When he'd done it a couple times, a small amounts of money, uh, he, he, he was, the money was coming back. He, he did it for like six months, and he called me. I thought that sounded pretty good. And so this was, this was like 25 years ago. So I, I put in a small amount just to try it out. Sure enough, 30 days later, I get it back, make it like 40%. I did it again, make it like 30%. Did it again. Three times, three or four times I did it over the course of three or four months. And, I, and every time I'm getting 30 to 50, it's, it's working. I'm starting to calculate, man, in 20 years, I'm going to be like David Green, right? It, it all multiplies. Well, then I made, one fi- I made a, my biggest investment to, to date. 30 days went by, no check in the mail. 40 days, no check. 60 days, no check. I'm starting to get nervous now. My brother calls me. The concert promoter embezzled $15 million and was in the Cayman Islands somewhere, and the FBI was trying to hunt him down. We lost everything. The last investment, we, made, we lost everything. Now, fortunately for me, I broke even on the whole thing, so it was kind of just a, uh, a lesson to be learned. And what I learned was there's a difference between wise investing and foolish investing. Uh, some investments are good. Some investments are not so good. And that's what we see here in this story. Back to Matthew 25, verse 16. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. He made five talents more. And so also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now here we see what could be called two different investment strategies, right? One is rather aggressive. The one who received the five traded with it immediately and made five more, doubled his master's money. The one with two did the same thing. Now, we don't know what these guys did with the money. Uh, They might have, uh, you know, invested it in the stock market. I don't think it existed in those days. They may have uh, started a new business. They may have started a new product line. We don't really know what they did, but they doubled their money. And by the way, notice here that Jesus, in the way he tells this story, indicates he has some kind of business sense. I think we forget sometimes. We think of Jesus, you know, as Bible guy, you know, Messiah. But we don't realize he spent most of his adult life uh, working in a carpenter shop. Uh, and he was the, probably the primary, as the oldest son, the primary breadwinner and supporter of his entire family because he probably lost his father years earlier. So Jesus knew how work worked. He knew how money worked. He knew he had the work to turn a profit. He knew how money worked. He knew how investments work. You see this in just the way he tells the story, and we can forget that sometimes. We only know that the master, doesn't, he gives no uh, instructions. He just gives them the money, and they invest it, and they double it. Then we see the second investment strategy. It's a little more conservative. The one talent guy digs a hole in the ground and buries his master's money. We aren't told why he does this. It's the equivalent of taking the money home and stuffing it under your mattress, right? We aren't told why. We learn a little bit later in the story why this third servant, the one talent guy, does this. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So we have the master's gift, we have the servant's responsibility, and we have, thirdly, the master's reward which is the most important part of the story. Anybody here seen a a TV show called Underground Boss? Oh, sorry, (laughs) Undercover undercover Boss. Undercover Boss? Well, I had not seen it, but I was talking to some younger staff members, and I asked them, I said, I need a little more current TV thing. I did the Gilligan's Island thing, did the Millionaire thing. I need a little more current illustration. So he told me about Undercover Boss. So I looked it up online and read about it. And it's a, it's a show where the boss is a CEO or something. And he comes out of, the, out of the boardroom and he takes a very low-level job in a company where none of the employees there recognize him or her. And he just does a job. And he watches how, people, well, how he's treated by his own employees. And then after a week or two go by, he goes back to being CEO, calls those people in. They go, uh, they realize who they were working with. And some of them uh, are promoted because they were great employees. And they treated the boss really well. Some of them are not promoted, and some of them are terminated because he found out he had some pretty lousy employees. We kind of see that here in this story. Verse 19, Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I've made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So the master comes back and settles accounts. Jesus says in the story. This tells us that the talents given at the beginning of the story were sort of on loan, and the servants understood that. They knew the day would come. They didn't know when, but they knew the day would come 
when the master would want to hold them accountable for what they did with his money. Master rewards the two servants that invested his resources wisely, the two that turned a profit, a very good profit, 100% return, and he does three things with them. First, he gives them verbal praise, well done, good and faithful servant. He gives them more responsibility. You've been faithful with a little. I'll put you in charge of much promotion, increased trust. And then he invites them into his joy. Enter into the joy of your master. We see a couple of things here as well. Notice Jesus, I told you he understands what, it, what work is like. Uh, I think he knows what a good boss looks like, right? Think about it. Some of you have had good bosses, some of you have had bad bosses. But if a boss gives, a, gives affirmation, holds employees accountable, and rewards productive service, you have a pretty good boss. If he does all three of those things, you have a pretty good boss. That's what Jesus does here in the story. But he also is giving us a spiritual truth, and here's the truth. While salvation is a gift of grace, no one can earn their salvation. It's a gift of grace. It's what Christ did for us on the cross. You can't earn that. You can't deserve it. You can only receive it as a gift by faith. While that's all true, it's also true that God expects and rewards faithful and effective service. He does. Every single one of us will be accountable for our lives for how we've used the resources he's entrusted to us. I think he's also telling us a little bit about heaven here. The Bible has more about heaven in it than we think it does. It tells us about eternal life. It's telling us that our lives right now in some way are preparation for the life that is coming, the life that we were originally created for. There will be a reward. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a gift. But there will be reward in heaven, in the kingdom of God. There will be service there will be great joy. We won't all do the same thing in heaven, and it'll be based on how we serve here. That's what, it's, that's what he's saying. But he's not finished with the story yet. Verse 24. He also had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed, so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents, for to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is the hard part of the story. Almost all of Jesus' parables have a zinger somewhere in them. Here's, this, here's the zinger. We, the first thing that crosses our mind and hearts is, is that seems a little harsh, right? It, it just feels kind of wrong when we get there, when you really read the words. Why? Why is it so harsh? Well, here's why. If we understand the parable, we see that the one talent guy completely misunderstands his master. Completely misunderstands him. First, he, he underestimates his master's authority. He says, I know you'd be a man who reaps where you did not sow. Right? Basically, I know that you take what's not yours. First of all, he, he's accusing his master of being dishonest and being a, a thief. Secondly, the assumption is that, that the master doesn't own everything. But if the master owns everything, as I said before, if God owns everything, if the master owns everything, it's not possible for him to reap where he did not sow. He owns everything. It all belongs to him. So he's underestimated his master's authority. He misjudges his master's character. He says, I know you to be a hard man. We already know the master is wildly generous and trusting of his servants. So he mis misjudges his character, and the result is fear. I was afraid because this is what I thought of you, so I buried it in the ground. He's afraid of the image of the master he's created for himself. He's afraid to fail. He's afraid to try, so he buries it in the ground. So let's look at the judgment of the one-talent servant. You wicked and slothful servant. The one-talent guy refers to himself as afraid. He says, I was afraid. And he blames his fear on the master's character, right? The master judges him to be wicked and slothful or lazy. And he says, 
if you were so afraid of me, if that's what you really thought I was like, you should have taken my money and at least just put it in a CD in the bank somewhere. You still wouldn't have to do anything. You would have put it there and I would have got at least some interest back. So he's basically calling this guy out. You're not really telling me the truth about why you did what you did. And then we see this almost stunning conclusion. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. And cast this one out into the outer darkness. Now for many years, this part of the parable right here at the end just bugged me. It just didn't seem very Jesus-like, right? To take the one away from that guy and give it to the one who's got ten. Right? That, that, that doesn't feel right. And I felt like that until I met many years ago a man named Randy. And this is one of my favorite stories. It was, it was formative in my life at the right time. And some of you have probably heard me tell this in different, different places. But it was many years ago, 1987. It was at the end of my first year here at this church as a youth pastor. I was taking one of the very first short-term mission teams we ever sent as a church. It was seven high school kids and myself who went to rural Mexico on a farm project for a group called Food for the Hungry. <clears throat> uh, we spent most of our time digging uh, irrigation ditches in this um, very rural, rough farm field. And it was, it was, conditions were tough. It was like 100 degrees every day. Food was bad. Uh, some of the kids got sick. I hadn't checked out the trip ahead of time, which is why we always do that now. We learned that lesson on this particular trip. So we were there, and we, we were struggling through the week. And there was another group there at the same time. I had seven students and myself, and this other group had a few uh, 20-somethings from a church in Colorado there at the same time we were, doing the same work we were doing. So we got to know them. And a guy in their group was a man named Randy. He was 25 years old, and he had cerebral palsy. And Randy was a great guy, but his cerebral pal <coughs> palsy gave him certain limitations. Uh, he used arm crutches to get around. He didn't walk very well. And so he was limited. It was very rural. It was rutted pathways, and, and he would fall. We'd have to, we, had, we learned by the second day to always have somebody standing right next to Randy, helped him get everywhere because he would fall and he would hurt himself. So it, it really slowed down some of the work, frankly, because we had to always be watching out for Randy. And he couldn't go out and dig in the irrigation ditches, so he would sit on a little pad of concrete all day long, and he would, put, uh, he would take little cellophane bags, stuff them full of soil, and then two seeds, one corn and one bean, to be planted later in the ditches we were digging. And he, did, he would do that hour after hour after hour because he couldn't get out to the fields. So the week goes by, and we're at one of the last days, of, the last day of the trip, and we're out at the irrigation ditch, and we're digging, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard work. And we look up, and Randy is heading toward the, the, the field where we're digging. He talks someone into carrying a chair for him. He's got his arm crutches. Somebody's helping him, and he's make, inching his way out to the field. And I'm standing next to his leader, and Kent's saying to himself, what's Randy doing? What's he coming out here for? So we wait, and Randy gets all the way out to us and announces to his leader, Kent, I want to dig. I'm tired of doing the bags. I want to dig. And we didn't say anything. He was pretty determined. They plopped down a chair, and he sat down on this chair, and we handed him a pickaxe, big heavy pickaxe. And he had real strong shoulders and arms because he had dragged himself around his whole life with crutches. And the ditch is like four feet deep. And he, he does a little swing and pulls up a little bit of dirt. He has a little grin. He swings a second time a little harder, pulls up a little bit more dirt. And now he's got a big old toothy grin. He's having fun now. And the third swing, we were also standing watching. The third, third swing, he swings with all his might. Just swing, and he throws himself right out of the chair, head first into the ditch. His feet are sticking up like that out of this ditch, and he can't get out because he can't, he's just stuck head first. So we go running over, and we grab him, and we drag him, pull him up out of the ditch. He's got dirt clods stuck to his face. His nose is bleeding, and his leader, Kent, great guy too, was, was frustrated. And as we get him out, Kent goes, Randy, what are you doing? And I'll never forget it. Randy looked up at him, big old toothy grin, and goes, I'm just serving Jesus, Kent. What are you doing? <laughs> it was a perfect answer. It was a perfect answer. And on the way home from that trip, I learned what this parable means. And I've understood it ever since. Because God is like the crazy boss. He, God is like the tra crazy boss. He has invested his extraordinary resources in his servants, and that's us. And he wants us to invest them boldly in his kingdom for his purposes. Remember, I said we're all in this story. You might be more like the five-talent guy or the two-talent guy or the one-talent guy, but notice there's no zero-talent people in the story. It's five, two, or one. They're all different, but they're all there. Randy wasn't a five-talent guy. He wasn't a two-talent guy. If you'd asked me 
on that trip, before that last day, I'd have said, probably not a, maybe a half talent, maybe a quarter talent. Slows the rest of us down. But what Randy had, he invested with joyous enthusiasm, all in. He put the rest of us to shame. Because somewhere in rural Mexico, there's a field of corn and beans growing. Because of the thousands of bags of dirt and seed Randy sat there and did over and over again. Not because of the digging, but because of the seeds he prepared. What he had, he invested. And that's what the parable is about. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't. But we do all have the same opportunity, and we do all receive the same reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. You bow with me as I pray. Lord, thank you so much for this powerful story. The stories you told are so rich, uh, so well constructed, and we can find ourselves in them. Help us to do so. Thank you for investing your resources in us, for trusting us with your gifts. Forgive us for so often burying your gifts in the ground, maybe out of, out of ignorance, or maybe out of some fear, maybe out of laziness. Maybe we just don't know any better. Teach us to invest your gifts, our lives, boldly in your kingdom. And ultimately, may we know your great joy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.